Heavenly Father, Lord, we, we thank you, Lord, and we praise you for all that you are. We thank you, Lord, for the blessing of salvation, Lord, we thank you for the grace and mercy that you have shown so many times. Your faith and your truth. And Lord, uh, time again, so many truths. We speak of things and great things you've done for us. You sustained, sustained us in hard times, you healed our bodies, you lifted our spirits. You've given us a home in heaven. Father, now, for Carolyn, Lord, we just ask in the name of Jesus, Father, move upon her body right now. You know what is it worth. You know all things. In fact, you are in her. There's nothing that surprises you. Lord, you know what is it worth, and we pray in the name of Jesus right now, Father, and Christ name. Set everything right. Heal her body from the top of her head to the bottom of her head. Lord, make everything right. If doctors are going to be involved, we'll accept that, but we know we don't need them. So we ask even now, apart from any doctor, any medication, right now, Lord, stop any adverse effect on the body. <coughs> Heal her hand. And however you choose, we'll give you the praise and glory for you are a at this very moment, Lord, we ask for healing, we ask for wholeness, we ask for help for her. And Lord, we pray for her fear. The fear is coming, the pain comes. Lord, you speak to her heart right now in her mind. Quiet her spirit. Let her know in an oh so way that you are with her. Bless her with your peace. And above all things, we heal her body. And we ask for this in Jesus' name. And all the church said, Amen. Amen. I've got a Bible, turn with me to the book of Psalms this morning. Psalm 23 is going to be your text. A very familiar one. Psalm 23, and I already messed up off today because I told him it's simply Psalm 23, and once I got it here, just before I got up to the Bible, I was actually some other verses. And we've got a Bible here today. All right. Good deal. Now, if you don't have one on these first few verses, uh, Walter probably can catch up with me, but I'm not going to throw that on him. You can't. Look at your Bible. It's, it still has the Word of God in it. You don't have to have a screen or a projector. And then the other thing is that if you're sitting next to somebody they got a Bible, you don't slide over, okay? Share your Word with them. What I want us to look at today, I want to look, look at it in a fresh way from the 23rd Psalm is this. That very much when you go to the 23rd Psalm, when you read that Psalm, we think so much of David. We think of the Old Testament, we think of the Old Covenant, and the Old Testament days. But what I want us to see today is I believe with all my heart that the 23rd Psalm, in fact all the Word of God, has many ways and many times of speaking to us. One consistent truth. But there's also what's called sometimes double fulfillment. There are a number of prophecies in the Bible that were fulfilled in the Old Testament. And then looking back through the cross, you can see Jesus Christ also is a fulfillment of it in a different way. And the same is true this for David and when he speaks and when God gave him the 23rd Psalm. And as we do this, then I want you to first think about this reality. That the Psalms are also not simply, uh, it's called wisdom literature. They, they, they group it with Proverbs and, and that's how they teach it. Uh, and by they I mean like a seminary. And in fact, uh, the Jews, uh, when they taught it, you'd hear uh, Jesus, uh, for example, would say that everything taught in the prophets, in the Psalms, by the Psalms, the shorthand meant not only the Psalms, but Proverbs, what was called the wisdom literature. Now, I'll say all that now to get back to where we are, okay? Forget all that right now. When we look at the 23rd Psalm, when God gave David, the 23rd Psalm, I believe it has fulfillment and purpose for us here in the, two ne in the New Testament church. And one of the ways I think you can help focus on it is this. First, I want you to go to Psalm 22. Now, you got Psalm 23, right? Okay, Psalm 23 is going to be right here. Right here in this book, all right? And, but on its bookend, before Psalm 23 is gone now, all you people went to the Public schools. What is it? Psalm 22. Right? And 
after Psalm 23 is what? Psalm 24. Oh, you're learning stuff already today. Now, what I want you to see is this way to do it visually. From your left to right. Now, if that, whoever moved the cross, that was good because the cross would be on the wrong side today. Amen. All right. Okay, the men moved the cross today, and I'm glad. Because what I want you to see first is look at Psalm 22, verse 1. Written a thousand years before the crucifixion, more or less. Verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Surely everyone recognizes that verse. That is one of the seven sayings that Jesus spoke from the cross. He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Come down to verse 7. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out their lip, and they shake their heads, saying, He trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him now, seeing he delights in him. That was fulfilled at the mocking at the cross. In fact, Matthew tells us that it says they wagged their heads and said, If thou be the Son of God, come down. Now, so what is happening here in Psalm 22? You're seeing a picture of the cross. Turn over to verse 16. For dogs, O Testament words for unbelievers, for dogs have compassed or encircled me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. This was written in 1000 B.C. more or less. The Assyrians were the ones who first came with crucifixion, not the Romans. They learned it from the Assyrians. And at that time, there was no such thing as crucifixion. The Assyrians had not come to the point where they used it as well. So we have here that pierced my hands and my feet. We know how is Jesus crucified. They pierced his hands and his feet. Look on down, look at verse 17. I can tell all my bones. They look and stare upon me. In other words, he said, as I hang on this cross, I can literally feel every bone in my body. Verse 17, then look at verse 18. They part my garments among them and cast lots for my vesture. What happened with Jesus' garment? They cast lots for it. He gambled for it. So you see the prophecy. Now the prophecy here in verse in Psalm 22 is speaking of what event? The crucifixion of Jesus Christ in his first coming. So in Psalm 22, you have Jesus Christ coming to this earth, prophesied here, coming to this earth, dying on the cross, his hands, his feet pierced, encircled and mocked. And there in Psalm 22, you have the prophecy that would happen. And it did. Now, Jesus died. He was buried. He rose again on the third day. And he ascended back to heaven. But Jesus is coming again. Amen. Amen. Now, when he came the first time, when he came the first time, when he came to suffer and die, he himself gave himself a name. He said, now I am the good shepherd who gives his life for the sheep. He came the first time as the good shepherd. Look at Psalm 24, verse 7. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, even lift them up, you everlasting doors, and the, God, the King of glory shall come in. Who is the King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. What's it speaking of here in verse 7? The second coming of Christ. Christ is coming again. He came the first time and he suffered as the good shepherd who gave his life for the sheep. He ascended back to heaven. And now in Psalm 24 he speaks about a time when he will come again. And this time he will not come as the meek and lowly. He will come in that day, that time. He will come as a conqueror. He will come into Jerusalem. In fact, it says that he will put his feet upon Mount Olivet and the earth will split. And they will mourn as they see the one they pierce. The Lord's coming again. Psalm 24 speaks of that. He's coming to Jerusalem. Now, Jesus gave himself through his cross. A 
the title there. And what was it that Peter said? He said, now when the chief shepherd appears, we shall receive a crown of glory that faith is not away. So he has a title, he has a name in Psalm 24. Between here and Psalm 22, he comes, he suffers and dies, prophetically as stated there in Psalm 22, as the good shepherd. Prophetically yet to happen, he's coming again in Psalm 24, the chief shepherd shall appear. And what he speaks there of, the chief shepherd, everybody else that pastors, anyone else that speaks, ministers, we're just under shepherds. All the authorities in the chief shepherd. And when he comes, he will give to all his reward. So it'll be a wonderful time. But between the 22nd, the good shepherd, the 24th, the chief shepherd, is the 23rd. That's us. We live between the 22nd and the 24th Psalm. We live in the age that's called the church age, when Jesus came, suffered, and died, accomplished and came to put away the power and work of sin, send it back to heaven, send forth the Holy Ghost. Now we speak, now we preach, and for 2,000 years we've been living between the ages of the first coming and the second. And in this age, what is it like to be a Christian? What is it like to say, I know the Lord? What is it like to say, I believe, and the Lord leads me? He has a title here. And now David speaks of it in Psalm 23. That's us. So what is it like for you to know the Lord? Look at Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, and I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He shall lead me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. When David was led by the Holy Spirit to pen the 23rd Psalm, and he began to write, I believe God gave prophetic what it is for us. And now, that being so, I want to ask you, what is it like to be a Christian? What is it like to know the Lord? What is it like to live between the first coming and the second coming of this church and the Well, let me tell you what it's like. First of all, it's like this. The Lord is my shepherd. And when he says, shepherd, I believe that David's heart had to leap because David knew what a shepherd was. A shepherd was more than simply somebody that showed up for work. A shepherd lived with the sheep. The shepherd labored continually with the sheep. He slept for the sheep, slept. He never left the sheep. And that's one reason in the New Testament, for example, when God brought the shepherds out of the field, Jesus' birth, People believe, and I'm one of them, that that was significant because God was making a statement there about outcasts. Because shepherds were considered outcasts. Why? Because they never left the sheep. They couldn't come to the temple. They never partake or, you know, or took part in any of the ceremonies, any of the feast days, the three that were required for Jewish males. They never came to those. Why? Man, they were shepherds. And they had to stay with the sheep. And when he said that, now the Lord is a shepherd. What would that mean? That means that David would know is that the sheep would become so attached to the shepherd and the shepherd so attached to the sheep. The sheep were his. They belonged to him. They would even know his voice. And they would say, and scholars say that they would not even follow the voice of another. Only their master. Only the shepherd could call their name. And Jesus spoke of us that way. He said, now my sheep know my voice and they follow me. They will not follow a stranger, but they will hearken unto my voice. How many know what I'm talking about when the shepherd speaks? We know. And when he says these things too, he there, the shepherd would live with the sheep. And uh, Spurgeon wrote once, and uh, his guy lived back in the late 1800s, and he went to the Holy Land, and he said the first shepherd he saw, he was told his son. He expected to see, you know, the guy with the robe. 
big crooked stick nonsense. The guy I saw looked like a warrior. So he was dressed for battle. He had a club. And said, man, you know, you could tell he was intense. And he did not look like a guy just kind of drifting along, man. He knew what he was there for, and he was there to protect the sheep. There were adversaries, there were enemies, there were those that would seek to destroy the two states. And sheep were done. And it's not coincidental that God, that Jesus' most common analogy for people who follow him are sheep. We're done. They're the dumbest animals on earth. They have no, think about this. Sheep have no camouflage. How many animals you know have no camouflage? How many are just totally white? I, you know, they're white, they have no camo, they have no fangs, they have no speed, they have no claws, they can't run in any degree, they just got the little hoods, and above all things, people tell me they're stupid, <laughs> that they're dumb, and thus they have to have a shepherd, so the shepherd is totally committed, so when David says, the Lord is like this, the Lord is my shepherd, when God said, that's the word I want, David. That had to mean great things to David, and it ought to mean great things to us. And notice who is the shepherd. The shepherd is, look in your, in your Bible, the King James, the Lord, L-O-R-D, all capitals. Anytime you see that in your Bible, L-O-R-D in your King James, that means Jehovah. The one who is my shepherd is not the Baptist church. The one who is my shepherd is not any pastor I've ever had. The one who is my shepherd is the Lord God, Jehovah. The one who created the heavens and the earth. The one who delivered Lot but judged Sodom. The one who delivered Noah but judged the world. The one who can do all things and protects his people. The one who has all power, whatever he speaks is. The one who knows all things, is all things, and it never allows anything to be out of the sight. That is my shepherd. Jehovah is my shepherd. And the most important word for anybody here today in that first verse is two letters. My. I'm so glad he didn't say the Lord is a shepherd. He said the Lord is my shepherd. We've heard this, but it's bears repeating how important it is between a shepherd and my shepherd. I spent three days, that's when he's not tired, I spent three days with my newest granddaughter. Just got back last night. She's my granddaughter. <laughs> now there's our, there may be a grandchild here today, but it's all the difference in the world when I say my granddaughter. When we say a child is sick today, that's one thing. When we say my child is sick today, that's completely different. Child is hurt. My child is hurt. The child died today. My child died today. We know the difference between A and my. And when God chose this word my, what he's saying is that we are connected. That the shepherd. Jehovah is connected to his people and there's nothing that touches your life that does not touch It says in the word that he sympathizes with us in our weaknesses. It says that we are the apple of his eye. You know what that is? I used to think, I hear that phrase, I thought it was like, you know, a real pretty apple. It looks real attractive. No, you know what the apple of your eye is? It's the pupil. And it says, with the apple of his eye, what's one of the most tender things in, 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 your, in your body? Your eye, your pupil. I can go up to anybody that doesn't have glasses on and do like this, and you instinctively blink your eye. Blink your, and, and pull back, right? Why? Because there's, it, we're wired to protect it. It's precious. It's tender. And it's something that is very, very much in need of care. So when he says that we are the apple of his eye, he speaks of us the same way. God cares about us. He loves us deep. So thus he said, the Lord is my shepherd, and because that's true, I shall not want. He makes me lie down, look at verse 2. He makes me lie down in green pastures. Again, there's the dumbness of us. We don't know where the green pastures are. We may think we're in the green pasture, but we always want to get to the other side. Amen? We always want to keep moving. We want to go here. We want to go that. We do not know where we need to be. God knows where we need to be. And he will at times even compel us to stay right where you are, doing what you're doing. And then when it's time to move, he'll take you to the next green pasture. He knows where they are, and you don't. 
But the key here now, you're going to see, I pray, is that it is always about movement. My shepherd is moving. He takes me to the green grass. He knows where it is, and he says, all right, we're going to lay you here. I'm going to make you lay down here. There's some propulsion to this. And now, I'll take you to where the still waters are. What do I mean by still waters? But, well, still waters mean water that doesn't move. Water that is very still. And thus, what it's getting at there is like sheep are so dumb. If they want water, they'll walk right into it. Like the creek was the other day, and they'll sweep them away. He knows where the place of protections are to nourish us. And thus, he'll take us to the still waters. And he'll dare compel us. And then when it's time, he not only does those things that he leads me beside the still waters, look at verse 3. He restore up my soul. Always he is moving us. We are in a life of movement. I live between the first coming and the second coming. And thus when he says he restore my soul, my friend, what is it like to know the Lord? Just to have Jehovah as your shepherd. Just to have someone who's leading your life and knows what you need even when you don't know it. And one who restores your soul one who is never giving up and always full of grace and mercy. And there are times, no matter how much he speaks, and my sheep hear my voice, and I do hear his voice, and then we fall, but sometimes we drift. We'll drift when bad things happen to us. We'll drift if sickness comes. We'll drift if sin overtakes us. We'll drift because of the sins of others. We'll drift because of the disease of others. I remember one of the greatest times of drifting was my mom's and her cancer. John and I saw that. I can remember drifting terribly through the, I had, I had uh, nine back surgeries in 11 years. And just, I've never given up on any good thing ever happening in my life. I drift. You can drift and preach. How do I know that? I've done it. You can drift and show up every Sunday. You can drift and still say, praise the Lord, sing the song. But then on the inside, you know, you're not where you need to be. You're not tight. You're not close. You're not hearing his voice. You're not having any strength. You've lost your sense of joy. You've lost your hope. But let me tell you, if that's you, you hang on. Don't give up. Because the good news is, he is a restoring shepherd. He not only saves you and says, now, follow me. If we drift away, like Jesus said, He'll leave the 99 and seek us out. And he'll see, he'll call, he'll search. And like that one who searched out the, the one who left the, the 99, Jesus talked about it. When he finds him, he picks him up, and he puts that sheep upon his shoulder. And he says, now let's rejoice. That which was lost has been found. I tell you, he comes and he'll find us. And if we're battered and bruised and I've been there, and you're scarred up and you're full of uh, thorns and and, and scrapes and marks, he'll take the oil and he'll wipe them clean. He'll, he'll minister to you. He'll fill you up. He'll take away your pain. He'll lift your burden. He'll give you the peace you need. And then he'll pick you up and he'll carry you till you're able to walk again. Now that's our shepherd. And that's what it's like to be one who knows the Lord. And some of you that don't say, wow, wow, you're talking about a lot of pain, a lot of trouble. Listen, you got pain and you got trouble. But the difference is we got a shepherd. We got somebody that knows when we hurt. We got somebody that can lift you and touch the very soul within us. We got someone who can speak encouragement. And not only that, we got one that will carry us when we cannot walk. Yes. Brother, we need it. Just like the old guy that tells about, uh, says, well, we had this call come to rededicate. Listen, I don't, I don't mind. I think people need to rededicate. I used to, and God forgive me, but I used to come every annual when I, the, the anniversary of my salvation day, when I got saved, I'd come that week every Sunday and I'd rededicate on that particular Sunday, rededicate my life. And I heard one pastor say, so he had this one guy, you know, he'd drift. And he'd come, and he'd, he'd come every Sunday to rededicate. The pastor said he just about wore out his dedicated, <laughs> rededicated. <laughs> and, then he'd come and he said, you know, it's the same deal. He said, I want you all to pray that I'd be filled with the Spirit. And he said, I would put my hands on him. I pray that he'd be filled with the Spirit, be filled with the Spirit every Sunday. He said, every Sunday, every Sunday. And so finally one Sunday I was praying. And I heard my associate over there. I said, Lord, it's filled with the Spirit. 
My associate said, Lord, there ain't no use, he leaves. <laughs> We all leave. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. So we need one who can restore our souls. None of us are perfect. And if we always, if any of us think we are, we're messed up. You need to get right. Yeah. And what it is then, to know the Lord is like this. We've got Jehovah who is our shepherd. He leads, he guides, he knows where we need to be. And if we drift, he doesn't let us wander away. He'll never give up on us. He seeks us out. And then he restores our soul. And then watch this. And he leads me, verse 3, he leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Why does he lead me? Don't miss that. For his name's sake. He doesn't lead me because I'm worthy. He doesn't lead me because I'm low. He doesn't lead me because I'm somebody and I deserve to be led. He, lo he leads me because he is the shepherd. And he has committed himself to me. And he is faithful and true. First Timothy, he remains faithful even if we're faithless, even if I give up. He does. And that's for his name's sake. For his own glory and honor. In his own faithfulness, he restores and then he leads me in the paths. Everybody see an S there? Paths of righteousness. I've lived long enough. I can tell you there's more than one path you're walking in life. Paths of righteousness. There are times of sunshine. There's times of shadow. There's times of rejoicing. There's times of sorrow. There's times of help. There's times of sickness. There's times when you know exactly what God is doing. And there's times you say, I cannot see it. I can see no goodness coming out of this. But if we're following the shepherd, it is the path. Of righteousness. So the key is keep up. Pass forward. So what's it like to be a Christian? We have a shepherd. It's Jehovah God. He knows what we need. He knows where the grass, he knows where the water. He leads, he guides. When we fall, when we fail, he restores. He takes and leads us on for his name's sake. Not because we're worthy. If we did that, we, none of us would make it. He does it because of his own name's sake. He seeks us out, he restores us, and he leads, he guides. And even through the different changes of life, for his name's sake, he keeps leading. And our simple job is keep following. And sooner or later, he leads us, our shepherd us, to the place nobody really wants to go. Verse 4. And you ain't going to walk through the valley of the shadow then up here to leave him. Are you with me? It's like this. I've been saying, if I make it to my next birthday, I will have been saved longer than I was lost, which is good. It's 67 years as of Friday. And sooner or later, whether I'm wanted or not, as I walk in this life, and when I was 34 and I was saved, I vigorous, felt like I knew everything, strong, very aware of things I could do. Now I seem like I'm more aware of all the things I can't do. But all those years you follow, you're following him. As you follow him, something happens as you move later and later into your life. Or it can come very sudden in younger life. But this is what I can tell you it's like. He says, in Yeko, I walk through the valley of the shadow. Why is it called the shadow? It's called the shadow. If you read the book of Hebrews, it makes a big distinction between substance and shadow. There's things that are the substance of the coolness of it. The shadow, if you stand somewhere, you can make a shadow. You see the shadow, it, it, it is a, it's an indication of the real thing, but it's not the real thing. It's less than the real thing. It has a semblance of it. And when he says the shadow of death, the reason he says the shadow, not real death, is that Jesus took the real death. Real death is to be separated from God forever. Real death is to be plunged not only in this life, living apart from God, but to be plunged into a sinner's hell. Real God, real death, is to be out of the absence of the Creator. Not to be in His presence. Not to be there. And that's why even Jesus said that this is eternal life. To know God. And if you know God, you are linked to Him. You are part of Him. But death, 
fullness, real death that Jesus took on and we talked about on Easter was when the world turned dark and he was separated from the Father. He took and tasted the fullness of real death so that all who believe in the Father we get the shadow. We'll separate from this body of flesh but I will never, ever be out of his presence. That's right. I am in his presence now. When I slide out of this body of flesh I will be even more in a no so way in his presence. So when he says, now, you enter into the shadow, the valley of the shadow of death. It's like when it's as if he's walking and he's guiding. Here's the shepherd. I'm one of the sheep and I'm back here in the crowd. Me and Luke and all of us there. And all of you all, we're all walking there. And we keep bragging on our Lord. We'll say, man, the Lord, you wonderful look over there. That's my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. He leads me. He guides me. He restores me. He does all those things. But notice something that turns you very quickly when you get to the valley of the shadow. He doesn't say he or thee. It turns into first person. He says, Jacob will walk through the valley of the shadow of death. You, Lord, are with you. See? None of these words are relaxed. And every word, every dot, every tittle, Jesus said. Suddenly he changes the personship in terms of relationship to the sheep. As they enter into that valley of the shadow of death, it's as if the shepherd turns, the Lord turns and says, okay, now I'm coming. I separate you now from the rest. And I'm no longer speaking about the Lord. Now I'm face to face and I'm saying, you Lord. You Lord. Nobody else can go in there with me. My, my wife can't go. My children can't go. My mom and dad, if they were here, they couldn't help me. There's only one who can help me. It's the one who's already been through the valley. It's come back from the other side. That's my shepherd. He says, now, come on, draw close. And when he said, now, this is what it's like to be a Christian. We're all going to die, but here's what it's like to be a Christian. When death comes and when we create, we Press that mountain and we begin to ascend down into the valley. All the others separate and go apart. But the shepherd then draws near to me and we're face to face and he's closer to me than he's ever been before. And he leads me and I shall not fear. Why shall I not fear? Because we're face to face with the very God of glory, Jehovah himself. And thus I speak as a metaphor, if your rod and your staff they comfort me. The rod was a weapon. I got gave one once. I was at church and preached a sermon. Doing a revival, and he brought one back the next night. He got hold of it. And they're about this long, and they what they generally make them out of over there and use them for. They're made out of roots. That makes sense because anybody ever tried to cut a root around here? You can't cut one, right? And bait and bait and bang. So what they do is they take like a root of a tree about so long, and they take that and he'd carry that through his belt and it would be a club. So your rod, it was a weapon. Anything that would try to come between me and my shepherd, anything that would try to destroy me, the devil. Demons, whatever it may be. He's there as I enter into the valley of the shadow of death. My shepherd draws up near and he said, Now I'm getting you through to the other side. I know where we're going, and nothing, nothing is going to prevent me from making you through this, riding through this. So I take the rod and take comfort in the arm because I will do battle with you. I can beat away any enemy. And not only that, I have the staff. Now that is that crooked stick you see on the Easter play. And what with the other that, that's not a weapon. That's something to guide. The sheep would get too far to the left or to the right. They'd take that and then strike him on the left, on the right. If he'd fall into the ditch, the crooked stick was used to reach down, pull him out. So what you see when he says, my, the rod and the staff that come from me, is you have the power, the weapon to do battle, and you have the guidance and the wisdom to get me to the other side. So thus, we got it. <coughs> Now, everyone is going to die. This is what it's like to be a Christian. You got a shepherd. You got God Jehovah who's there with you going through the valley. And nothing, nothing can prevent me from getting here. Now, watch. They would change everything. Next verse. What you have now is this you prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You prepare a table before me. 
Does that mean that the shepherd is spreading the table out for the sheep? No, that, that doesn't make any sense. He's, he's changing the method. Because what the psalm is to teach us, brothers and sisters, is what it's like to be a Christian. What it's like to know the Lord in this age. And there's only so much you can say about a sheep and shepherd that will apply to that. So now he switches it. He said, now, it's not just having a shepherd that leads, guides, and takes us through the valley. It's like having a host. It's in a world of adversity, a world of hardship. And I need more than protection. I need more than God's brother. I need some fellowship. I need someone that I can talk to. I need someone that's willing to listen, not or that, who's got all the time in the world to listen to what i got to say, and has got all the wisdom to speak back. I need someone who can comfort me, someone who can encourage me, someone who can lift my head up even when I'm beaten down. And when he speaks to you this way, he said, now this is what it's like. The Lord is like a shepherd. He leads, he guides, he protects. He'll take you all the way through the valley of the shadow of death. But it's more than that. He's like a host. He prepares a table before you, even in the presence of your enemies. Right in the middle of the battle, there's always a table spread. And fellowship was meant in that day. When they would call and you would have a meal, it was not about simply eating. It was about walk, uh, talking, fellowshipping, learning, listening, sharing. That's the reason when you see Jesus invited to these different meals that he went to, it was a big event. And what they'd do is the, the meals would last for hours and hours. Wedding feasts, historians say, could last three to four days. They would see, be together, talk together, and what he's saying here is it's like having a host. i got people all around me. So much confusion. And I don't know what to do or where to turn. But... This is what it's like to my Lord. I've got a host. He's always got a table spread. And how many spread? Before me. Before I even get there. Before I have a need. He's always got the table spread. And he's always saying, come inside. Be still. Come here. Sit with me. Let's, let's talk. Let me nourish you. Let me redeem you. You're welcome here. Got your head. I want to anoint your head before. In Old Testament times, that was a symbol of generosity. It was a way of saying, You're welcome here. Remember Jesus, when he went to Simon's dinner, and, and the woman of the city came in and said to Simon, Simon, you didn't want me before, but she's in one of my feet. Jesus picked up on that. He knew that he had not been received in a way that was. So what God is saying is, look, don't come to me thinking I want nothing to do with you or I'm too busy or I hate to ask for this again or I hate to talk about this again. I always got a table for you. It's in the very midst, in the middle of your enemies and troubles and persecutions and everything around you and no one else understands. And maybe you don't even understand. You pull aside. I don't want your head before you. You're my child. You belong to me. Not only that, I'm going to refresh it. What about you? Now I'll take the cup and I'll pour the wine. And I'll pour it. And I'll show us and I'll pour the cup. I said, no, no, I'm still pouring. He gets closer and I said, well, thank you. Well, I got it. No. Keep pouring. And he gets up for his top and rear and I say, oh, Lord, you're going to spill it. And he's keep pouring until it overflows. It runs down my arms. Drops off my old eyes. What's he saying? He said, Child, you're welcome. I would hold no good things to you. Don't ever feel like a stranger when you turn and say, Lord. Don't ever hesitate when you come in and eat your knees and say, Father. I don't want your head with oil. I'll pour the wine until the cup overflows. There's nothing. Nothing. So I can tell you this. What's it like to know the Lord? Just to have a shepherd who leads, guides, and takes me through the valley of the shadow of death. Just to have a host who's always gracious, receptive, and welcome. Where I can rush to at any time, find strength, love, 
understanding, renewal. And then Jesus, or then David says, and if you can't get that script, if that doesn't say it all to you, then let me just put a bit of ribbon in Next verse. Surely, not maybe, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. Sure. Goodness, because it's a tough old world. Mercy, because I'm a sinner saved by grace. And I still <coughs> need forgiveness every day. They will both be there with me every day of my life. And then what? And I will dwell in the house of the Lord. Get the fish. We live between the first and second coming. And in this life, one of the most unsettling things is nothing stays the same. But I want to tell you something, church. That's God's will. Nothing's meant to stay the same. We burrow, we live, we die. But this is what it's like to follow the Lord and know the Lord. It's like having a shepherd who knows where the green grass is, the one who knows where the still waters are, the one who will lead, who will guide, who will protect. If I sin and fall for, he seeks me out, he restores me, he keeps me going, he puts me back on the path of righteousness, he takes me through the valley of the shadow of death, and if I get discouraged, he's like a host that spreads out the blanket and says, come on, sit down, let's talk, let's listen here, Martin, let me speak to you, let me minister to you, let me refresh you, let me renew you, and I will give you goodness and mercy all the days of your life, and I'm saying, but Lord, things keep moving. Can't we ever just sit down and have peace? Lord, can we just ever hold on and things stay the way they are forever? And his answer is, yeah. Not here. Not here. In this world, you'll have persecution. In this world, you'll have obstacles in this world, you will have pain, you will have sorrow, but there's always goodness because I'm your shepherd, I'm your host, but I know what you need more than anything. You want a place where there's no more pain. You want a place where nobody grows old. You want a place where all those that you love you uh, and you love are around you and where kindred spirits can gather and there'll no more grown, there'll be no more troubles, there'll be more no difficulties, and today will be good because tomorrow was good and to, yesterday was good and tomorrow would be good. Every day would be the same. Wonderful, good, gracious, all of those that we love. And the Father says, that one's hell before I know I'm taking it. You'll be in the Father's house forever. Forever. Remember Carolyn in prayer. So here is what I want you to walk away from you. Number one, if you want to get through this world and, and just hold on and nothing change, you need to realize nothing stays the same. Christians. What's it meant to? Do? Second thing is as they change, take every opportunity in the moment you have now. Take the times and opportunities to invest now, wherever you are, because things will be different tomorrow, but one thing will not be different. You have a shepherd, you have a host, and thus I ask you soon, when you live your life as we live your life, let's not stumble like those who do not know. Let's not run in the dark like those who do not know the Lord. We've got a shepherd who will guide us. We've got a host that will renew us. Courage and strength. And we've got a destiny that nobody can take from us. We've got a house for the Lord and it's forever. I know where I'm going. So let's live like we know where we're going. And when we live and make our choices here, let's make them based on what matters to Because that's going to be and will be the reality of our permanent existence as well. Paul said at this point, he said, do not be conformed to this world. But be you transformed by the renewing of the changing of your mind. Change your mind in what way? 
You know the Lord? Then avail yourself to your shepherd. You know the Lord? Then avail yourself to your host. Call, see him, walk with him, talk with him, draw near him. And as we live this life, and when you get to the Father's house, you will look back. And in that day, in that day, we'll see. And we can say, the choices I made are wise. The choices I made, I live for God, not myself. That's the call. That's a blessed truth. If you don't know the Lord, you're on the truth. Nothing's staying the same for you either. When we try to keep things the same and hold on to the same, you have to simply move to change. And do this. Call upon the Lord. Receive Him as Savior. And then change and movement has a purpose. Every step that I take, every breath that I take, every day I rise, I'm one step, one breath, one day closer to where I will dwell forever. And I'm ready. Anybody else ready? I want to get that. I want to get that. Let's bow our heads. Every head bow, every eye closed. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for this truth. I thank the Lord for all that you are. Lord, I thank you that. You've given us these truths and they're, they're alive and they're real. And they are to be the experience of every child of God. Forgive me, Lord, of all the times that I've come short and felt to forgive, felt to live, felt to embrace, living like I didn't know where I was going. For every child of God here today, Lord, I pray for new things, strengthen them. Let them live with the life of purpose, knowing where we're going. And to live every day, availing themselves, laying hold of you as a shepherd.